my job here is just to say a word of introduction, uh, and then I hope to lightly moderate uh, questions from you to our guest. Uh, I am very pleased to welcome her here to the Berkman Klein Center. The question of my interest is this. She was a principal architect of a remarkable event, which I will describe to you. Its quality of virality, its integration of persons across lines of difference, totally remarkable. Its focus, its organization, it was all, in a sense, a product of the net. My question, having pulled off such a magnificent thing, how do you take it forward? What is your thought in taking it forward? How do you turn it from the event to real consequence? I give you Caroline Weinberg. the question that I've been asking myself for the last six months. So um, I'm Caroline. I was one of the co-chairs and lead organizers of the March for Science, which um, you know, many of you probably know, but a, it was a, a movement to advocate for science and society and policy. And so usually my speeches about this either revolve around kind of aspiration, like your voice matters and you can do amazing things, or um, I berate the scientific community for not having done enough um, to kind of protect our present and future in policy. But given where we are, I'm going to kind of shift and talk about uh, a little bit about how the internet was involved in the planning of the march and what we're hoping we can kind of get out of it moving forward. So um, the march, so I, the names of the people who are most associated with the march are mostly people who organized the Washington, D.C. march. So myself and, and um, Jonathan Berman and Valerie Aquino, who were two of the, um, the other co-chairs. But it's, uh, we get, I guess, too much credit for the March for Science because it really was a global movement with no defined founder. Um, it, staples. Um, it was founded by thousands of people around the world in 600 cities. Um, it took a couple of hours before it went viral and it was just everywhere. With, in the first five days, there were 40,000 people who volunteered to help us organize it. Um, there were people organizing it all over the world and several organizations that reached out wanting to get on board. Um, we actually had so many, uh, so many emails when it first started that uh, we missed a lot of really important ones and looking back on it, we were like, oh God, we wish you had been more organized. Um, but all of those people were involved in founding the movement. Um, so I could give a long kind of Oscar style speech right now with all the names of the people who were involved, but from, from creating the mission to partnerships to Facebook moderation to satellite coordination, um, but it really is just thousands of people who were involved in this. It was really remarkable. And by the time we all gathered in Washington, D.C. on April 21st, the march was on April 22nd, um, most of us in Washington, D.C. had never met each other. So we all, we all kind of set up shop in a WeWork, and people would, would kind of trickle in, coming in, and we would just look up from our computers and say, kind of, hey, what's up, and then just go back down to our work. because it, there was, And then we would be typing to one another, even though we were in the same room, because we just got so used to communicating on on the internet. I mean, this entire movement was created on Slack and email and Facebook and Twitter. That was the way that everything happened. So um, it's actually hard when you think about the way that it, it arose to kind of wrap your mind around the way that marches happened before the internet existed. Like a, an idea would spark at a meeting and then people would have a conversation around it and it would spread by phone and by letter and, and kind of from friend to friend. But the way it happened with us was it went viral on Twitter and then, you know, in the blink of an eye, we had 800,000 Facebook followers and anytime you wanted anything to happen, you would just blast it out to those people. And it really is, it's just a remarkable way to be able to do things, to build a, a community of advocates around the world, to learn about the issues that are important to them and to find out the ways to make themselves heard. Um, so there were good and bad things about doing this on the internet. Uh, one good thing is that it um, provides instant feedback. So some of the most painful moments around the March for Science happened 
uh, happened on the internet, when we were getting, when we were being called out on mistakes, particularly around things like diversity inclusion in the march and social justice, both within the march and within the scientific community itself. And these things were constantly coming up and this real time criticism forced us to confront our mistakes and address the wrongdoings. Um, but it was a very surreal experience for most of us who had definitely never had to confront these issues on such a large scale. Um, but it also makes you defensive in a way. I don't know if any of you have ever had the experience of having thousands of people yell at you on Twitter, but um, it's not fun. And even though you do learn a lot from it, from it, um, it makes you defensive, especially when you've done things to correct it and they, and they keep coming up and you kind of want to shout, like, I promise we did something about this. But it's, you know, you have trouble walking it back. So, so that's a good part, the organizing part and the getting real-time feedback that help you be better. Um, but there's also the internet is also a terrible place that lives forever and kind of once a misconception or falsehood gets out there, it's just going to follow you forever. Um, a lot of cases they were just kind of demonstrably false, like rumors that that controversial scientists were on our board when they weren't. You could go to our website and misprove this, but um, science reporters who <coughs> theoretically um, consider themselves advocates of evidence just kind of never did that research. And once those things are out there, it's hard to get it back. Um, and in other cases, as, as scientists, a lot of us were used to kind of you take a, a long haul plan of you take months to set something up and then launch it into the world, which is not how it works when something goes viral on the Internet. Um, and so we were in a lot of times waiting for the plans and language to be perfectly crystallized before we announce them. And that's how kind of rumors start and misconceptions would get going, um, which I feel like is the tension that was at the root of a lot of the issues that we faced where kind of the nature of how a march grows on, grows on social media is that people want immediate details. They want to know what's happening and they can ask you those questions immediately. Um, and it's hard to communicate the reality of what's happening when you are working to create this global event over time. And so we were working so hard to make things work smoothly that we, it couldn't be instantaneous, but people wanted immediate <coughs> feedback. And it turns out that, trust me, it's coming is not an effective way of dealing with criticism. So we, we were constantly dealing with that issue. And these things aren't unique to the March for Science or social movements in general. They are happening all over the internet around everything. Um, and it's the internet is a great way to communicate research and findings and get these movements going, but it's also invites snap judgments that are hard to reverse and um, creates just this lightning fast spread of misinformation that is impossible to get back. Um, I actually, well, I just learned it's an anomaly, but do, how many of you know that thing about the pillow with the feathers in the wind? No one? Okay, there's this old, <laughs> this is old idiom where a, where a guy spreads a lot of rumors and the person who um, is telling him that he basically shouldn't be such a gossip says, go and get a pillow and cut it open and, um, and all the feathers go out in the wind. And, um, and the, the man who was criticizing him says, you know, go and get back all the feathers. And the guy who spreads all the rumors says, you know, I can't get them all. They went off the wind. They're all over the place. And he said, that's like a rumor. Once it's out there, you can't pull it back. So that was kind of how it was like on the internet. Um, and and that's, just, that's just kind of something you have to accept, that once things are getting out there, you won't be able to pull them back. So um, knowing that, you have to think about the ways that the internet, um, you just have to accept the negatives and think about the ways that it can be channeled for good. And so there's two, two ways that kind of I've thought of as we as we come along thinking about these things. The first is that um, we have to get science and science advocates, people who are committed to evidence-based policy, to speak for the evidence. The concept that the evidence will speak for itself is not actually accurate, and we need to be doing that. There's this idea that the last stop in scientific inquiry is getting published in a scientific journal, but that can't actually be true. Communicating it to the public and having people understand it needs to be the last stop. And we have this internet, this opportunity with the internet to kind of reach out from behind the ivory towers and not just talk about science in the um, in scientific conferences and in journals. We can actually have these conversations in public and the scientific community as a whole is just kind of blowing it, so to speak, in doing that. And we're missing that follow through of getting, getting the science to the people who need it most. Um, and we need to be thoughtful about it. You can't just throw out information. In a lot of ways, a boring scientist giving a talk is, is just as um, hurtful to kind of science advocacy as, um, 
as misinformation because no one wants to listen to it and people discount it. So scientists need to better be ambassadors in their communities, but we also need the skills to do it. So if that's having someone teach you how to condense a 10-page journal article into like a couple of 140 character tweets, that's something that needs to happen. And we need to take better advantage of the ways that we can communicate on the internet and make sure that that's effectively done. Or it just went up from 140, right? It's like 280 characters. Yes? No? Um, so scientists just need to evolve with the, with the public. We need to understand how to communicate better. And we need the people who have those skills to help us do it. Um, and the second part of it is digital advocacy, which I'm actually curious um, people's perspective on, because it's, it's relatively new. And um, like a lot of other social movements, the March for Science uses digital tools to amplify our advocacy efforts. So mostly social media and emails, but there are other ways around that. We can, you know, with, with a couple of clicks, create letter writing campaigns and, um, and petitions. We can use resources to make it easier for people to find their representatives and call them. We can do all of these things. We can disseminate guides to advocacy so that people better understand the issues. Um, but the, the problem that we have is that, um, as we talk about how to transition from this march to a movement, is that the day of the march, the day of, of most marches, is incredibly powerful. It's a hugely passionate day. People are all out together, they're kind of cheering for the same thing and carrying their awesome signs and having this amazing day. And then you go home, and it's kind of like, what's next? And you have this transition period trying to figure out what those steps are. And the, the real challenge is how to, how to get people not to become complacent. Not, oh, I signed a letter last month. Or to, you know, to only advocate when there's a crisis going on and not have it be a year-round thing. Um, I, I called my representative last time. Something terrible was happening in the world. Like, I... I don't have time to do this. I'm doing something else, and it's and I, that happens to me as well. I mean, I've you know, it's not as though I regularly contact representatives, although I should be. Um, the so it's figuring out how to do that, how to get digital advocacy and make people feel that passion, so that there's constant change and people are constantly involved um, is the real question. How to continue that? How to sustain that motivation from that one powerful day into something that people want to be constantly advocating for in the digital space, which is the most effective way to reach people. So how do we create a Facebook post or a series of tweets or the emails or um, you know articles or whatever it is to make people get involved on that level? And um, <laughs> that's way above my intellectual pay grade. So I was curious kind of what, what people think about, about the best way to do that and how how to channel the in-person passion into something that translates into kind of the digital world. And that's it. So you're really putting questions out to the school. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I figured they know what they're talking about, and I don't. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, I'm waiting for people out there. Hi, so thank you for what you've been doing. Um, so my name's Steven, I'm a law student here. Uh, I have a background in environmental science and a friend of mine, uh, Eric, and I started this organization where we've been experimenting with science communication and music festivals in California because a lot of people there espouse that they love science, love evidence, but then simultaneously believe the earth is flat and that crystals heal people. So what we've found is actually quite useful is that we'll take scientific concepts that are kind of easy to understand and systems science is often the uh, avenue that we've taken with this, and we'll chop up YouTube videos very quickly. So it's like rapid fire media that people can see the visualization so they can get the complex concepts quite easily. And we're starting to get a lot of headway with it, and a lot of people are like, wow, this is amazing, I'm so engaged. And uh, we've been having kind of the same problem, like how do you do it digitally? But I feel like if you can make, have a scientist talk over something, they don't necessarily have to be, you know, a physics professor isn't usually the best uh, vocal advocate. But if you can have them practice and then have like a video running, I found that to be like in a very effective way to get people engaged uh, using digital media. And it's been very helpful um, in doing it over the internet and in person. Thank um, you. Somebody else. Um, hi, I'm Leslie. Uh, I am. Um, I, I just got out of Dartmouth, and I'm going to a programming boot camp for um, I'm mostly Latina students, but there are also some African American students there, and and so we're we're sort of facing the same issue: how do we get involved in in you know 
ideas larger than ourselves and and I am constantly thinking you know as I hear about their families and I think of Maslow's hierarchy um, in that you know many people are sort of worried about the issues right in front of their faces in terms of their immediate survival I mean at least the <coughs> people that I know so <laughs> <laughs> there, there you go see <laughs> so, um, so maybe somehow, to me, I think, okay, how, how do we make this relevant to sort of the smaller concerns that people have in their daily lives? One of, one of the things that we're working on is that um, there, there's like the big, the big science issues, you know, that people, that a lot of people care about. There's the environment, which is super important, um, climate change, funding for healthcare, um, uh, you know, clean energy. There are these things that a lot of people talk about that are really kind of commonly in discussion. But what people <coughs> don't necessarily often talk about is kind of the smaller things that people feel really passionate about and finding a way to to empower people to advocate for that. You know, like we, if we send out a national email or if someone's running a program where they're thinking of it on a larger scale, they're going to target the big issues that most people will get behind. But um, like one of the things we're working on um, is, is these one pagers to help people advocate for science better on the issues that matter to them. And we sent out emails to, we have more than 270 partners who are really involved in the scientific community or, you know, are the scientific community. And um, they, they, we reached out to them about the big topics, but a lot of them wrote in with these kind of small issues that we wouldn't like vector borne diseases, which is not something that most people think of kind of empowering people to advocate for, but is incredibly important in a lot of communities. And so that to me is like a part of it is figuring out how to find what people are passionate about and not just kind of like shove your passion on them, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah. Other, yes. Two things. Um, the MIT Energy Hackathon is happening this weekend, Friday through Sunday. And there's going to be a challenge on what do you do in the wake of the hurricanes, all right? So how do you rebuild the energy infrastructure? I know that's happening because I proposed the challenge and they accepted it. And I would like to see that go viral. I would like to see the weekend become a global brainstorming on this particular issue because I think the technology is mature enough and practical and affordable enough now that we can actually get together as a group, either there or online, and provide a vision of a possible future that can affect the people on Barbuda, the American and British Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. So that's one thing. So the idea of having a practical project that people can work together all right, may make some things happen. <clears throat> what I do is every week I publish a listing of energy and other events, things that are happening in the Cambridge area. Events like this, things that are happening in the community, things that are happening at other colleges and universities. I've been doing that for eight years, and I thought that the climate change community, because a lot of the stuff that I publish is about climate change, would be interested in that, right? It turns out that they're not. I can't get mothers out front. I can't get 350 mass. I can't get the mainline environmental institutions to recognize <clears throat> that there's an opportunity here to affect policy because major pol policy people come through Harvard, MIT, BU, Tufts, so forth and so on, and you can ask them questions. And to learn what the science is across the silos mm -hmm. and compare notes. And if they did that for a semester or a year and pooled that information, they would know more than the experts with a, a, wider, a, a wider sense of the knowledge, wider perspective. Cambridge, Boston, about 60 colleges and universities. You could do that in every major city, right? It's a quarter time job for me to put that out. But I found that it's really difficult to get over that spark gap of looking to information, all right, as political, 
Right. So those are some of the things that I see. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's in terms of making things go viral, I, I, wish, <laughs> I wish I had a better answer for you. I would have liked nothing more than for the mark not to go viral immediately so that we could have had some things in place first. You should let so, your network know this is happening. <laughs> well, you should reach out because that's you, so, so part of it is. Um, is is specifically target like you were saying um kind of specific chapters for different organizations and finding out how to how to kind of get into that specifically um i i learned the term over the course of the march influencer which i had never heard before um but i don't i wasn't really involved in social media before this happened um and so it's getting people who have who have a following really to support it i feel like is the is the best way forward in that but but I mean, it is a constant challenge, is figuring out how to get people to, to some, you'll, it's frustrating, right? Because you come up with this amazing idea and you're like, oh, great, everyone will be behind this and then no one is. And then you have some silly idea and people are like, oh, this is great, let's put it everywhere. And you're kind of like, but wait. So it's, I mean, figuring out how to do that is a, um, is I guess one of the, is would be the third step in, uh, in how to channel the internet on things like this. Hi. Uh, thank you for organizing the march. I, I participated here in Boston. It was a wonderful thing. Um, I, I guess I'm about to assign homework. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, I am at a college. If, if you're not familiar with the work of Zeynep Tufekci, um, you, should, you should read her latest book, which is or her f first book, Twitter and Tear Gas, The Power and Fragility of Network Protests. Um, it you know, read it tonight. Um, I mean, it ta seriously. I, I mean, it, it, ta tonight, it, but. it talks exactly, um, you know, to your point. Uh, I also think she's a Berkman Klein fellow. <laughs> so if somebody could connect you to, that would be wonderful. Um, her, um, she's a longtime activist and protester herself, um, as well as a sociologist at um, University of North Carolina, and she compares the modern state of protest, the one you describe, um, to, for example, the Civil Rights March on Washington, Martin Luther King's March, which took a decade to mobilize. Um, it wasn't just <laughs> folks um, calling each other up and getting them to Washington. I mean, they were dealing with an extremely hostile environment where they really had to get hundreds of thousands of people into Washington and out at nighttime, by nighttime, so nobody would die. Um, and when you're organizing something like that, you build all sorts of capacities. You build relationships. You build organizations. Um, you know, you build a network of people. You know, who are working long term. You know, to do things which you then can apply in different ways. I mean, it wasn't so much the March on Washington that sparked you know the civil rights legislation. It was the fact that you know. There were organizations built by it, you know, who were going to affect elections, um, and I, um, I mean that. If I were to offer you advice, it would be think about capacity building. What do you want, you know, people to do? You know, more than just sign a letter. What are you, you know, what what are your goals? You know, pick a target. Who do you want to defeat in the next election? I mean, something really tangible that brings about change because. Everybody's for science. Um, I shouldn't say that. That's Surprisingly not. not. <laughs> that's um, why I'm here. Many people are for science. You've proven that you can get, you know, millions of people out on the street for science. But you know, what what's your theory of change? How do you actually expect support for science to change the world? Um, <laughs> it's a heavy question. So the. So I think that I think that what you're saying about the need to kind of build capacity and have things keep going is why starting in you know the March the March went viral I think on January 24th and already in February we were thinking about what the next steps were what happens after this and part of it was because we had managed to channel this incredible passion and we wanted to make sure that it kept going and part of it was we were working so hard that we were like this cannot possibly end on April 22nd we have to have something kind of going forward to show for it and. 
And what the key, I think, is going to, so we're nonpartisan, so we're not going to target any specific politician. <laughs> I should say that very clearly. But the, the key is to, in terms of capacity building, is to empower local leaders, is to create a way to make sure that there are strong organizations all over the country and the world that, that carry that torch and that continue doing it there. And it's about... Um, there's only so much you can do from a national platform, really. Like you can, we can come up with big campaigns that target issues that everyone can contact, but the, the real change is going to happen locally. It's going to happen when people elect their local representatives. Everyone from the school board up to the president needs to be a focus of attention. And so empowering local leaders, which is something that um, having individual chapters of things is, um, is really what the, the most powerful way to do that. And a lot of the satellites that were involved in the march are continuing on with these thriving organizations. Some of them are staying as the March for Science, some March for Science kind of branded. Others are doing completely different things, but all are united by this shared goal. And so making sure to, to build that local strength and to empower local leaders is really, I think, the best way to, to keep things going so that it's not just um, beholden to a central organization, but it's really empowering everyone. Does that make sense? Hi, my name is Ryan. Um, over here. Hi, sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I was still um, thinking about his question. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm currently a law student here at Harvard. Before I came here, um, I had a very heavy background in the life sciences. And looking back in retrospect on my formal educational training, there was a really distinct lack of training to be an effective communicator. You know, there's lots of very heavy detail. I know the biosynthetic pathways to proline, but how do I describe what an amino acid is to a person who hasn't had a biology course in 20 years? Yeah. So I was wondering if you could comment on what kinds of curriculum changes you think would be very valuable to people at both the undergraduate and graduate level, and how do we convince these higher education institutions to enact some of these? So that's actually something I spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, I, and it's really important because people don't, scientists, if I'm sure that many of you have probably had a conversation with a scientist before who just kind of like runs talking about their research and you have no idea what they're talking about and they haven't really noticed the blank look on your face because they're so focused on what they're saying. And, and figuring out how to confront that is, is kind of part and parcel with how to make a stronger scientific community that communicates with the public better. So personally, I think it starts with, it starts at the undergrad level and the graduate school level where I think it should be absolutely mandatory that there be science communication classes as part of that. If you can't break your, down, your research down to a way that makes sense to someone with, um, who has taken like only a high school bio class, then you need to go back and kind of get to know your research better in a way that it can be communicated. Because what's really like, what's the point of it if, if it's not accessible to the general public? Your research needs to be accessible to everyone. So I think science communication classes need to be a standard. Um, how to I was going to say force, but encourage um, universities and colleges to have that be part of it is is a challenge and is something that I'm hoping they can kind of be peer pressured into doing um, and just making clear that it just should be something they do. I think that um, it should be part of scientific conferences. So should talking about how to get yourself involved in policy. Um, these things all just need to become the norm. And in terms of what to do with people who are already scientists, part of it is continuing education, taking those classes. But there's, there's a lot of resources out there for scientific communication to try to get people on board with it. But a lot of it is um, either dated, so it doesn't talk about ways to communicate on social media or to, to kind of be more accessible to people in different platforms. And a lot of it is too um, polite, I guess, in a way. Like, it's, <laughs> there's this, I don't, I mean, so scientists often, when they are giving a talk, they'll start with the first like four minutes of who they are and what their research is and where they went to undergrad and where they went to graduate school and where they're a fellow and they'll just go on and on and on. And there needs to be a guide where someone's like, literally no one cares. Just get to what you're here to talk about. Like, you know, and it's, it's so it, um, we need to find a way to be more upfront with scientists about what people are, are interested in and have those conversations better. And I think it starts with the undergrad, but I think um, we shouldn't kind of, uh, we shouldn't disregard the fact that hopefully we can teach the older dogs new tricks, I guess. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that, that getting scientific communication to be a standard class is gonna be the, one of the important steps.
Hi, my name's Dave, and um, thank you for the work you're doing. Uh, a lot of thoughts about it as somebody. Yeah, just up to you. As somebody who tries to do this in my community, it's very frustrating. I'm thinking about climate change in particular. And as you're talking about um, how to help scientists talk at conferences, I feel like that's a different topic. Yes, generally people need to be clear about what they're working on, but climate change is sort of the big one. And it's the one where there's so much misinformation out there mm -hmm. and so little being done in our schools to, to educate people. Um, do you see that as really the overarching topic? Or is this really just let's advocate for science across many um. domains? It really is going to depend on who you ask. Sorry? It really depends on who you ask. Oh. There's a, yeah. Well, no. So for me personally, the environment and climate change, super important. <laughs> I tend to focus more on like public health yeah. initiatives because that's what my background is. So I would be much more, com you know, I, I know about climate change and the environment, but not enough that I would give a talk on it. But if someone wanted me to talk on, you know, the opioid crisis or, or clean needle exchange programs. So I think what's great about the March for Science is that we have people with all these different perspectives who can speak to such different levels of it. And so, um, I mean, a lot of people agree that climate change is the end all be all of the conversations because it's obviously the one that has the, the largest scope and is really affecting the entire planet on every level. Um, but, but I really think that, uh, sorry? Including public health. Including, well, it does. I mean, that's climate change has a huge impact on everything from mental health because of trauma from the hurricanes to, um, you know, to asthma. I mean, it affects everything. So, um, so I think it's, it, it really is going to depend on who's, who's kind of giving the talk. Well, to me, if you're asking for opinions, I think the overarching issue is climate change. That's the, where the you're most... You're not alone. That's where the <laughs> most ignorance is. That's where the cataclysms are going to come from. We just had news yesterday that just in, I think it was 2016, uh, global greenhouse gas concentrations went up 1.8% in a single year. It, they're accelerating. Nothing that we've done has slowed it or even uh, steadied it. It's accelerating despite everything. And it's terrible, and nobody <laughs> understands it. And um, I mean, nobody. The great percentage of people don't get it, and they're fed torrents of misinformation. And even, you know, in my town, I wish I had a little toolkit where, what do I bring to the school board to say, what are you doing? And what are, your, are your science teachers empowered to even address this issue, or do they feel scared, which I think a lot of them do? Um, I, mean, I mean, that's I something on we're on working on, yeah. People seem like they're not willing to even discuss it. Well, the other. They're politicized, and it's huge problem and I don't see how, I don't know, I feel like we need to get, as you said, influencers, maybe if uh, houses of worship, the NFL, things that people do uh, sort yeah. of buy into, we're saying the same things, but if it's just the March for Science saying it, you're not going to reach any of these people. The other thing is that people get bored of hearing the same thing over and over again. It's really easy to tune things out. So people have been... Um, have been talking about climate change for a really long time and not getting traction anymore. So coming at it from a new angle is is I think important. You know, so so it is about going to um, you know it's important to talk about the way that there's um, you know emissions from like buses and bus depots, which affects climate change, right? Because there's too many cars, too many buses. Um, and but you can also talk about it how having those things create uh, dramatically increases like the rates of asthma in kids and so you can talk about climate change but take it from a different angle and re-engage people in it that way but keeping talking about like um, greenhouse gases and, and holes in the ozone layer and temperature rising and polar bears being hungry like nope everyone's tuning that out now so we need to find a new way to be having those conversations um, and part of it is doing things like creating toolkits like if this is what's important to you here's how you should advocate for it and and figuring out those new approaches needs to be key to dealing with them I just want to mention as a point of information that there's a very important article that's just come out in The Lancet about present day environmental impacts on health. So we should all read it, we should all know it, we should all find a way of communicating it to non-scientists. And I just wanted to mention one other thing because it's not come up in this discussion, I think it's important, that if you want to talk about how to end the world apocalyptically and dramatically and soon, don't forget nuclear war. I'm trying to, but no, you can't really. <laughs> um, 
Sorry. Hi. Um, so I'm also a law student in my former life. I was a cancer biologist. Um, so I'm, it's really great to have you here. But I'm curious, I think a couple of people have touched on this, um, but I'm curious if you have any ideas about not just influencing local, you know, local members of the school board, but actually training and helping people with science backgrounds run for office. Um, you know, here at the law school, we have a couple of programs, classes that, in theory, I think train you to do policy work or run for local type elections or run for office, but it seems like one of the ways to potentially change the dialogue would be to actually get people into those offices who already have that background. Um, so I guess this is sort of a follow-up to Ryan's question. Um, so there's a lot of organizations that do that really well, um, that, uh, that just have really amazing programs in place to do things like that. I think that, um, Personally, personally, not speaking for the March for Science, but me as an individual, I think that we should get, we should focus more on people who, um, not necessarily on scientists, but on people who embrace science and are willing to listen to experts as they do it. Because by default, saying that we should promote scientists and policy, which is not what I'm saying you were saying, but a lot of people do say that. Like the key is going to be to get scientists to run for for politi for um, for. Yeah, to be to be a politician. Sorry, <laughs> um, is it, it, that's not the necessary step. To me, it is is getting people in office who will who will listen to those experts because not all scientists are going to be good politicians, and they're going to be harder to find. But making sure that we find people who will listen to those experts and incorporate it, I feel like is as important a step as um, as getting scientists involved themselves. Uh, may I ask a question? Sure. Uh, the academic community, in its way, is like the science community mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, it stays out of politics. It considers its security, actually, to rest and its credibility to rest on staying out of politics. And certainly that's a value that's held very high by science as well. So this interface that you're exploring in its way seems very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And yet you, are, you were able to ignite this phenomenon. I don't, I'm not saying you ignited it, but you, you saw this phenomenon ignite where science came out and did something that was clearly political. And now you're in the position of carrying that forward. Are you not up against a huge inbuilt opposition at the core of, of science thinking yeah. that says, no, you're popularizing what we do. You're not serious about science. You're trying to explain it to people as opposed to do it. And that's not something that we should be teaching as the fundamental lessons of science. What, how, what do you say to that? We got that a lot, um, especially when it, when it first went, when the March first went viral. Um, scientists shouldn't be political and we shouldn't get involved in it. Um, and it was really maddening because uh, for, many, for many reasons, I mean, the truth is that, that while a lot of people, while it was, uh, the march was undeniably motivated by more recent political changes that maybe got a little more dramatic, um, anti-science policies have been around for a while. And the scientific community as a whole should be, and I speak as a member of the scientific community, should be like embarrassed that we didn't mobilize earlier. Because science is political. Science informs policy. It needs to be involved in that. And as scientists, um, we need to take that role in making sure that it is. And, and science is nonpartisan. That's the reason that, that uh, studies are designed the way, the way they are, to try to reduce bias. And by allowing people to make it a partisan issue, to say we shouldn't be political, we should stay out of it, we're not helping the world. We're doing, we're doing a, really, a really terrible job of kind of getting involved and having our research matter. And, and the academic community is like that too. They think they'll, they'll lose credit and people won't, won't pay attention to them and they'll, it'll make people think less of the field as a whole. But, um, 
I mean, <laughs> not to use our tagline, but like it, it is like the science, not silence thing. Like eventually you reach to a point where you can't in good conscience remain silent about things anymore. And um, we've more than reached that point. And so I feel that, and the scientific community really, um, really rose to the occasion. I mean, we had every, almost every like major scientific society in the country and a lot of them in the world get on board and involved because they all realized that we had reached a point where they couldn't stay out of it anymore. And I'm hoping that that creates a tide shift that continues, which is why he's not here anymore, but um, which is why things like science communication and teaching about policy are both important because those need to become a fundamental issue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't, I'm not calling on people. Well, I'll just follow <laughs> that with a, yeah. the question, um, really a question asking you to just address um, impact. And I, I think I'm curious um, what it is, if you could talk a little bit more about what you wanted to accomplish um, setting forth and, and if you feel like you accomplished what you set out to accomplish, um, was the impact more in the realm of getting um, scientists to, to think more about public discourse? Was it? you know, in the realm of asking the public to participate more in policy with evidence as a basis or in some other set of connections? Um, we had a lot of goals. Um, the, so I think there's, there's, you separate it, right? So there's the day of the march where the goal is to send a strong message that people, people, um, are willing to advocate for science and policy and having a lot of people turn out around the world was a very effective way of doing that. But then there's the, the kind of actual impact of it and that has to do with, keep, with getting and keeping scientists involved in policy, making sure that they continue to be more vocal about what they're doing. And that's something we're continuing to work towards and that has to do with things like, um, like making sure that it becomes a standard part of scientific conferences and, and scientific classes that you are involved in things like that and getting the public to greater uh, engage in science and with scientists um, in advocacy is is kind of the end all be all because that's what leads to lasting change. You know, if you empower people with the knowledge that they need to become better advocates, and that has to do with getting the scientific community to talk more to the public, that has the ripple effect of creating change in policy. And so we need to work towards that, I think. And, and I don't think it's possible to say at this point in time whether we've accomplished our goals. I mean, I want to say like, yes, awesome, we did everything great. But it's the, the, real, the real test of how, how, not just the March for Science, but how all of the marches um, and, and movements that have been happening for, for the last couple of years, and, and earlier than that too, obviously, and more recently, what's, what, is the, what is the impact of them a year later? What, is, what are people able to see? You know, it's a, it's a, um, it's a long haul study rather than, rather than short impact, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, hopefully it worked. <laughs> Ask me again in a year. Hi, uh, my question ties in both with Matthew's and with Charlie's. So in science, there's often a stigma against speaking to or sharing your research with the general public rather than say, uh, publishing in a scientific journal. And uh, scientists who spend a lot of time uh, trying to communicate their science to the general public are not necessarily looked upon by the rest of the scientific community in a very favorable light. How, what kind of mechanisms do you think could help change that from, and where, where do you think it is um, self-marketing and getting attention versus in a, in a good way versus in a way that maybe is distracting to their scientific goals? And how do you balance that? And then how do you bring that in into um, training programs or into conferences or even into grants? Like I know that for an NSF graduate fellowship, you need to write a section about public service. And so how can you build some of that into the curriculum and into programs in a way that is not going to be, um, that is going to be respected by the scientific community? Um. I hate that part of the scientific community, honestly. Like the, the idea that scientific communicators should be looked down on some way because they, um, they don't take their work as seriously is, is horrible. I mean, it's the idea that it, being able to communicate your science, I mean, I said this before, but being able to communicate your science to the public should be one of the most 
kind of like lauded and, Im and important things that you can be as a scientist, because that's what makes your research matter. Um, and so- but how, how do you balance the well, amount of time that you spend, say, on Twitter or responding to blog posts or uh, talking to journalists with the amount of time that you spend doing your science? So, I mean, don't spend all of your time doing, <laughs> doing either, I guess. Like, it's it's going to depend, right? Because there are some scientists who will become like professional scientific mm -hmm. communicators, and that's great. And there are some people who will spend most of their time in the lab and be and communicate some of it. Or there needs it should be a um, kind of a standard of practice that scientists who don't necessarily have time to do the scientific communication or aren't interested in it. Because some people, just no matter what you teach them, are not going to be good at that. They have like a scientific communicator buddy who they they tell about their work and that person communicates it. And, and I think that that's, that's part of it is A, getting the scientific community to recognize the fact that your research has the most value when it's communicated to the public and that there's this concept of, how, of um, like that you're dumbing down things by, by breaking them down to their most basic parts. But in reality, that's like the kind of the, one of the most important things we can do is making sure that it's accessible to everyone. And, um, I fully forgot what my number two was, but I do think that. But I think that that finding a way to make sure that the scientific community embraces that. I don't. I don't know how the scientific community is slow to change, but um, but it's what we're. It's it's something worth working on. And I think that as the younger generation of giant of scientists that grew up with social media as kind of a standard thing, that that hopefully will shift a little bit. And that there's this. I can't remember if it was IBM. There was a, a series of commercials where it was about like turning scientists into rock stars, like the equivalent of we should celebrate them the way that we we celebrate like uh, athletes and stuff. What? Millie yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of people to celebrate in science, and so having that kind of effect where people look at scientists as kind of the heroes that they are, um, hopefully will also make people more inclined to. Everyone likes you know <laughs> everyone likes to be applauded every once in a while, so hopefully we can create that. Yeah, hello, my name is Chebong. I'm a postdoc um, at Harvard, the government department here, and I'm working for Civic Education Project. And my question is pretty simple, relating to your social um, organizing experience, social movement organizing experience. So I'm more curious about kind of the going viral moment in your movement. So, and actually in the digital realm, um, it's really hard to reach a threshold for our voice to be heard. So my kind of sort of theory is Twitter or social media is a source of efficacy, but at the same time, lately it's a source of inefficacy because sometimes it's really hard to reach the threshold. And I know you've mentioned a little bit uh, or a lot about those kind of issues. There was a moment, but um, could you tell me a little bit more about a few breakthrough moments or tipping points in which you finally got a sudden increase um, of public attention. You sort of gained attraction in a public arena. Um, yes. So I guess, so the first one is when it initially went viral on Twitter, which um, I should know the exact name of the person who, who made that happen. But there were several conversations happening around it. And then, and then someone with a lot of followers retweeted a tweet about it. And it just all of a sudden took off. It was it was un it was unreal, and it just jumped to like from like fifty to thirty thousand followers in a couple of hours. It was amazing and also terrifying. Um, so that that was the first moment um, when when we kind of jumped to people knowing who we are, and then what followed after that was um, was articles coming out, some good, some bad, um, and and getting it more kind of mainstream. Not everyone's on social media, so that's what brought it to to a wider community. And, um, and then there were, were other small things that, that brought it up, but I would say the other big jumps that we had that legitimized us in a lot of ways in the scientific community, which made a huge difference in the response to us, was when we would get um, big organizations to sign on. So um, when AAAS, and, which is one of the largest scientific societies in the country or world, um, Research America and AGU, which are three like very large and well-respected societies, when they signed on, we had we we really had to kind of coax a lot of these, or, or not. We had to have very serious conversations with these societies about how we were going to stay nonpartisan and and what our focus was and what we wanted to do. And it, it took a while to to 
to make that happen. And then as soon as those societies announced, people were like coming out of the woodwork. They were like, oh, how do we sign up? It was as though the larger places had done their due diligence and people were ready to sign on. And then, so that was a huge jump in people, in people being involved. And then that's what happened with every new area that we broke into. So um, the, you know, getting our first museum was a big deal because then like a lot of museums and zoos came on. Getting an aquarium was a big deal. Getting a university was a big deal. Um, our first teachers associations. Every time we broke through a new barrier, um, other people would would kind of join the cause from that area. And that's how we built this really enormous interdisciplinary coalition where it was you know, the National Farmers Union with the American Society of Cell Biology, with um, with the National Science Teachers Association. I mean, just all of these people who wouldn't usually be sitting in the same room talking about science, sitting in the same room and talking about science. And so that really was the um, was what was what kept us breaking through is is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have everyone's email addresses? Everyone who was involved in the march. No, it, it, <laughs> I wish. Huge <laughs> It'd be great to have a million people. You've assembled this huge audience. Do you have a way of of pushing out to them, or is it just a matter of whether they look at Twitter or they look at this? So we have, um, you know, eight hundred thousand facebook followers in a secret group i don't know why it's called a secret group it's definitely not secret um and then a uh, three or four hundred thousand in a larger one i should know these numbers off the top of my head and then a twitter account so there's social media where we push stuff up and then off and then we have um we have an email list of i don't know 250,000 people or something along those lines and and the satellites all have their own email lists that they push their push either local or national campaigns to um, and and we're constantly building that as you run uh, letter writing campaigns and petitions and stuff you collect more emails of people getting involved but what really creates the bigger impact is the fact that our partners send out these initiatives to their lists so it's not just ours, but it's other people's as well. And that ripple effect is really what, what helps us communicate beyond social media. <clears throat> well, may I just say thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having me. And may I ask you all to thank her for coming. Thank you. Thank you.